Right guys, how we doing? Welcome back to yet another reaction video. My name is Jacob McDonald, welcome to my YouTube channel, and today, as a rugby player, I react to the most miserable offense in NFL history. And look, I don't know what I don't know what team is involved. I actually can't tell. He's got a white helmet, he's got a fucking a, 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 a yellow slash golden um What do they even call that? What do they call that? The face mask type thing? face um not quite sure either way he's got a he's got a glorious mustache but when we look to the left we've got a touchdown to interception ratio of 1 to 10 and normally that's the other way around three touchdowns to 30 interceptions i don't know what team's going to be involved what i do know is that KTO is is a, is a storyteller at the end of the day he will bait you into thinking oh this is the worst oh this is the worst oh this is the worst. no no by the end of the video we will see Officially the most miserable offense in NFL history and if it's three touchdowns to 30 interceptions Well, I'll tell you what I hope it's not this guy cuz um <laughs> well, I Look, I mean I, I wouldn't wish that on anyone either way guys. There's only one thing to do uh, And that is to start the video. So let's go the year is 1976 With the NFL's rise in popularity they added two new teams the Seattle Seahawks and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers Geographically, with being on the West Coast, the Seahawks joined the NFC West. Makes sense. And on the East Coast, the Buccaneers joined the AFC West. What? That doesn't make any sense. It didn't actually matter since both teams played different schedules than other teams, but still weird nonetheless. Anyways, in March 1976, both teams participated in an expansion draft and selected 39... Now guys, I just want to say that this... Neither of these teams are going to have the most miserable offense in NFL history. This is a storyteller. KTO is a storyteller um, of you know of the absolute highest caliber. And uh, look, this is this is just an introduction. I just want to tell you guys that because we've got 14 minutes to go of the video, and um, well, he's just setting a scene, so to speak. He's setting a scene. Players from the other 26 franchises, with their new rosters intact, Seattle and Tampa Bay geared up for their inaugural season. To put it lightly, things were a struggle. Both clubs lost their first five games, mostly by blowouts, before oh, they no. met in week six. This had officially become one of the saddest matchups the NFL had ever seen. Seattle managed to eke out a 13 to 10 victory in one of the most forgettable. So you're telling me that refs loved throwing flags even back in the 70s? Because I know they still love throwing them now. Um, in fact, in a previous video, we saw a flag that actually blinded a guy and, 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 and ruined his career for three years. He did get back in the league, and he did sue the NFL for damages and won. But, we're not talking about that. We are talking about, well, I don't know what we're talking about, but we'll get into it. ...performances ever. From there, the Seahawks would only manage to win one more game. Who mostly is that? by large margins. Who is that? But despite this... They were still much more impressive than the lowly Bucks, who failed to win a single game. The Bucks lost by an average margin of over 20 points a contest. Oh no. They had been the worst team in the- Oh no. The first season in the league, your inaugural season, and you lose every single game. <sighs> what was their closest game? Week three, losing nine to 14. Hmm. League by far, Actually, especially no. off- Cancel that. Week uh, six, losing 10 to 13. And that must have been the, the game against the Seahawks, actually. Offensively, they were shut out five times. Actually, no. And averaged an abysmal 8.9 points per game. The 1976 Bucks are well known as perhaps the worst team to ever exist. They surely produced one of the worst offenses of all time. Even Reddit agrees. But to me, the saddest part about all of this was that the 77 Bucks had an even worse offense. Well, that's impossible. They lost every single game in 1976. Get out there, you idiot! Get it so we can get it. Get it so we can get it. <laughs> oh, horse, horse. Oh, shit! <laughs> get out there, you idiot. Are you kidding me? No gut, guts. That's what's wrong with us. After the oh, shit. season, head coach John McCann thought it. his team was going to improve all around. 
but he vastly underestimated oh, there he is. how. There's the guy. Oh, there, there he is. What's he gonna do? Say what's up or say what's down? How hard it was going to actually be. Now, before we continue to the 77 bucks, this video is brought to you by SeatGeek. SeatGeek is a company Sorry, that mate. I've been working with to download the app. The 1977 Buccaneers went on to become the saddest offense that ever took an NFL field. Look, speaking of sad, uh, that Pirates of the Caribbean type logo is sad, and I much prefer um, the current Tampa Bay Buccaneers logo. In fact, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are actually one of my favorite teams. In fact, one of my top three. In fact, um, it goes Jags, Bucks, and then the Dolphins. And it at this point, I'm pretty sure the well the Jags are two and one, the Dolphins are three and zero, oh, and the Bucks are two and one. Either way, let's continue. And it was all the result of how the team had been built back in 1976 when the Buccaneers were created. They hired the highly successful USC coach John McKay, who had won multiple national titles to that point. He came in with arrogant confidence. I don't think the game is that difficult. It's no more difficult than college ball, huh? Not in my opinion. <laughs> like many other college coaches have tried to do, McKay came into Tampa and ran camp like a drill sergeant. A lack of water breaks, non-stop hitting drills, two-a-days that lasted 10 weeks. They actually were still doing two-a-days when the season started. It was so intense that during a practice, one of the players went into the facility for a bathroom break and snuck out the front doors and never returned. <laughs> it actually oh, no. became a running joke every time someone went to the bathroom. Like, is that dude coming back? This type of training proved to do much wow. more harm than good. And by the end of the 76th This is some season, nostalgia, guys. This is some nostalgia. Tell you what. 21 players landed on injured reserve. 21 guys had landed on injured reserve, with 18 of them getting knee surgeries. 18 knee surgeries? Are you joking? They were down so bad that they literally had a truck driver and an unemployed construction worker on the roster by the end of the year. This is all the result of the worst possible combination. A first-time GM trying to find talent, a first-time head coach who's never been at this level, and a brand new team with players who didn't know each other. After the Bucks finished 0-14 in 1976, the enthusiasm that had radiated throughout Tampa from fans to the players had vanished. The team had gone from exciting new beginnings to the laughing stock of pro sports in a year. They were essentially the last chance you of the NFL, a player's final stop before they were out of the league. John McKay's son, JK, who played wideout for that team, said in a documentary that when he had to go up against Steelers Hall of Fame corner Mel Blunt, that's when he realized that he was in the wrong line of work and needed to find another job. <laughs> now, when building up the 77 bucks to hopefully be more competitive, they- Man, they really did. They got anyone and everyone to play for the team. Well, we. Unbelievable. Actually improved their defense a lot. The defense had gone from giving up nearly 30 a game. Now the only thing I will say is that the Green Bay Packers helmet has not changed from the 1970s to the 2020s. Um, still the same. You know, white, white and green stripe down the middle. Uh, nice wee G on the side. Predominantly yellow. And uh, I've got one of those actually hanging on my wall. Um... It was a gift from a subscriber, and uh, what a gift it was. Just less than 16 a game, a massive improvement. Oh, that's a but massive improvement. on the offensive side, they were as lost as ever, and literally nothing could go right. Entering the 77 season, head coach- Tell me they won one game at least. John McKay declared the team to be, quote, stronger at every position, with the exception of the quarterback. Man. Imagine being in the QB room and seeing that quote. Beginning of the preseason, the unimproved quarterback room began to quickly get worse. The expected QB battle was supposed to be between Mike Borila and Gary Huff, two backup-worthy dudes who hadn't played in a year, but both suffered knee injuries in the first two preseason. Oh no, I can only imagine who they're going to bring in to, to play quarterback. Games. I can only this imagine. left an already down bad team to their third and fourth stringers. 
Parnell Dickinson, who had almost no experience, and the rookie, Randy Hedberg. Hedberg had just got done playing at the NAIA Division II school, Minot State. This has to be the weakest quarterback battle the league's ever seen, which was eventually won out by Hedberg. So how does a former NAIA Division II rookie quarterback listed as the fourth stringer who suddenly thrust into the starting role on the league's previously worst offense perform? Well, not good. Ah, oh, damn. In game one, Hedberg threw for 66 yards as the team barely managed to produce over 100 total yards and three points. In game number two, well, Hedberg he didn't give up any interceptions, but he certainly did in week two. Threw almost as many oh, interceptions no. as he did completions, oh, no. and with even less yards than the week before, he was benched following the contest. Game number three, the Bucks finally score their first touchdown Hang of the on. season. He had a quarterback rating of 2.7. That's got to be the worst I've ever seen in my entire life. Because of That's a fumble return touchdown. Even with one of their better quarterbacks, Gary Huff, coming back to play, the offense was still abysmal, failing to score any points. Game number four. Without the help of another defensive scorer, the Bucks. Hey, look, were this helped. is not going to... Look, I'll, I'll, I'll set a scene for you guys, just like KTO setting a scene for us. This is not the most miserable offense in NFL history, but it's one of them scoreless and Gary Huff threw three interceptions. Game number five, Expansion Bowl 2. Going up against the league's worst defense, the Bucks offense finally got their first touchdown of the season. It only took five games. They did lose that day, but their offense played way better than the previous games. <laughs> oh yeah, they're happy about point it. Outing That's looked for sure. like the breakthrough moment that this team needed to well, spark they still something. lost. So how did it translate? Well, in the next seven games, they went scoreless in five of them. Dude, in 12 games, they had scored four offensive touchdowns. That is Oh my insane. god. Could you imagine watching your team only score an offensive touchdown once every three games? Oh, you give up. To this point, the 77 Bucks were 0-12, and, and adding that to the previous season, they were on a record 26-game losing streak. The fans had gotten so relentlessly negative that they made shirts that said the sarcastic quote, go for zero. Let's just say head coach John McKay was at his wit's end. Max, uh, well, we didn't block him. But we made up for it by not tackling. We will attempt to come back next Sunday in Tampa Stadium in front of our own crowd. We've now proven we can't play on the road or in front of our own crowd. So we, we, we would like to have a neutral site. We went through eight quarterbacks. Every time I looked up, uh, start that guy. Uh, we had no audible system because we had the left guard was from Nova Scotia and the right guard was from, we just picked up from Philadelphia. They barely knew each other's name. Things had gotten so bad that when the Bucks entered week 13, going up against the New Orleans Saints, QB Archie Manning said that it would be an embarrassment to lose to Tampa Bay. Wow, an embarrassment? I mean, it's true, but I don't care who you are. You see someone say that kind of thing about your team, and it has to light a fire under your ass. These quotes were posted in the Bucks locker room, and in week 13, they came ready to play. Nice. That's what we're here. Oh, well, have a look at that. He's got some pace about him, and he gets in for the pick six. The Buccaneers put up 33 points in route to their franchise's first ever win. Oh, they fantastic. Four total Week 13, Season 2, the franchise's first ever win. That's unbelievable. Well, touchdowns. And guess how many of those were offensive? One. They had <laughs> what? Four touchdowns and only one was offensive. Oh, well. Okay, the defense definitely stepped up. Oh, mate. Well, it's a step in the right direction. I'll tell that. I'll, Two I'll say that much. Two pick sixes and a fumble recovered in the end zone. It literally took one of the greatest defensive performances ever for this team to get over the hump. And the <laughs> following week, their defense balled out again, forcing four turnovers, and they won for the second time in a row. This two-game win streak had brought the excitement back to Tampa and surely masked what the NFL had just witnessed from the Bucks' offense. Uh, I'm not sure what's going so on with his teeth. let's but, take um, a moment to look at continue. some stats. In 14 games, the Bucks' offense was shut out six times. 
That would have been seven if it wasn't for a defensive touchdown. As far as total touchdowns go, they scored seven offensively. That was barely more than what their defense had. Their three different starting quarterbacks produced some insane touchdown to interception ratios. Jeb Blunt, who was brought in right before the regular... Maybe this is the worst offense in NFL history. Normally he sort of throws a spanner in the works at the end of the video and, and, and surprises you, but... Um... Eventually started four games, and he had zero touchdowns to seven interceptions. The Rook from Minot State, Randy Hedberg, had zero touchdowns to 10 interceptions. And with six starts and... I'm assuming that's going to be three and 13. By far the best quarterback, Gary Huff, had three touchdowns to 13 interceptions. Oh my this God. This gave them a whopping the total of three passing touchdowns to The 1977 Tampa Bay Bucks, touchdowns three to touchdowns to 30 interceptions. I think John McKay was too nice when talking about how much his team had changed from 76 to 77. For the Super Bowl era, this is the worst combined quarterback stat line that I have ever seen. Now, to be more fair, even though those quarterbacks weren't good, it was made far worse by a terrible O-line, lackluster skill position talent, an inexperienced coaching staff, and overall the era that they played in. As that's, a whole, that's no Kyle Murray, I'll tell you that much. The saddest NFL offense in league history, taking away the defensive touchdowns, managed a measly 5.6 points per game. Oh no. Now, for context, here is the 77 Bucks numbers compared to every season's worst offenses since the NFL merger to 1977. Jeez, there's, a lot of, there, there's a lot of stats there, guys. So we've got the 1977 Bucks, obviously coming in last place, number 28. 14 games played, 103 points. Oh, shit! 103 points! But hey, at the end of the day, the Green Bay Packers, number 27. That year, 14 games, 134 points. It's not it's not that much different. I mean, 1974, you got the Falcons, played 14 games, 111 points. Um, but they are indeed the worst. Among those years, ever. there were three other teams that were even in the same ballpark. In the same season, the 77 Packers were terrible. They only had 11 touchdowns in 14 games, giving them four more than the Bucks. And they also Jeez, had... Was Aaron Rodgers even born? 16 less turnovers. The 76 Bucks were definitely bad, but they literally doubled the 77 team's offensive touchdowns. Really, the closest competitors for worst offense of this era was the 74 Falcons. They posted very similar QB numbers. They only had three more offensive touchdowns, and they actually turned the ball over nine more times than the 77 Bucks. When you put all the numbers on the table, the 77 Bucks offense was still slightly worse than the 74 Falcons. They were worse in most categories, and they were shut out twice the amount of times. So, all in all, the Buccaneers may have the longest losing streak of all time, and a record for the most shutouts in a single season. But guess what? Now they've got Tom Brady. But everyone has to start somewhere, and for the Bucks, things really began to turn around after that season. The following year, their defense improved, and with first-round quarterback Doug Williams under center, they doubled their offensive output. Then, in 1979, everything had come together. The Bucks possessed the number one ranked defense in the NFL. Yeah, it seems as if the defense was definitely um, the you know, star of the, of the team, so to speak. And their offense improved yet again, enough so that Tampa Bay made their first ever playoff appearance. Oh, then, wow. against the Eagles, the Bucks produced three offensive touchdowns, which really, it should have been four, on their way to victory and an Man, this appearance. this is some good footage, I must admit. 1979, this is some fucking decent footage. In their first ever NFC Championship. In that single playoff game alone, they almost had half as many touchdowns as their offense produced the entire 77 season. Here he's rolling. Here it comes. Roll out. He throws. Throws. Touchdown. Fires. Aims and fires. And it's a touchdown. Oh, wow. Well, would you look at that? The 1977 Tampa Bay Buccaneers, eh? The most, most miserable, def uh, miserable offense, sorry. In one of the... Well... It seems as if the defense was really coming together, but the offense, no, no.
No, it just wasn't good. It wasn't good whatsoever. But, hey, a couple of years later, thank God, you know, um, they stayed in the league. Because after those first two seasons, you'd honestly, you'd, you'd think about scrapping them. And I'm assuming the fans certainly thought that way. But either way, uh, thanks for watching, guys. Once again, that's another video in the books. KTO, absolute legend. Thank you for telling the story of the 1977 Tampa Bay Buccaneers and how they came back to become one of the greatest defenses in the 70s. And hey, they're Super Bowl winners now. Um, thanks to the likes of Tom Brady, um, Chris Godwin, uh, Scotty Miller, as there or thereabouts. Um, you've also got uh, Leonard Fournette, of course, Mike Evans, and the list goes on and on. Either way, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.